Hello, my name is Dr. Charles Withers, and I will be giving a talk today on ankylosing spondylitis. The learning objectives are as follows. First, I will review the classic clinical features of ankylosing spondylitis. Second, I will outline a diagnostic approach for patients with suspected ankylosing spondylitis. And third, I will discuss treatment options for patients with ankylosing spondylitis. During this talk, I will provide an introduction to the spondyloarthropathies, discuss the epidemiology of ankylosing spondylitis, along with pathogenesis, genetics, clinical features, and extraarticular involvement. I will then move on to cover typical radiographic findings, diagnostic criteria for ankylosing spondylitis, and classical exam findings before finishing with a summary of current treatment modalities. I will begin with an introduction into the family of spondyloarthropathies. It is a group of interrelated inflammatory disorders with similar clinical features and overlapping genetic markers. These common clinical characteristics include symptoms of inflammatory back pain, arthritis affecting the peripheral joints, inflammation at the site of tendon insertions or enthesitis, inflammation of entire digits known as dactylitis, and uveitis. Descriptions of patients suffering from illnesses with these clinical features can be found in historical records dating back to the 16th century, although our current concept of spondyloarthritis has its roots in the 1970s. It was during this era that the term seronegative spondyloarthritis was coined, uh, indicating that patients with this disease were rheumatoid factor negative. X-rays showing sacroiliitis and common genetic markers were identified linking diseases such as ankylosing spondylitis, psoriatic arthritis, reactive arthritis, and inflammatory bowel-related arthritis. Ankylosing spondylitis, one of the best described variants of spondyloarthropathies, literally means stiff or crooked back, as derived from its Greek roots. The primary clinical characteristics of AS include its chronic inflammatory nature, and its predilection for the axial skeleton manifested primarily as progressive back stiffness. AS is a relatively rare disease with a prevalence of only 0.1 to 0.14 percent. The frequency with which we see ankylosing spondylitis in the population is reflected by ethnic group and the prevalence of genetic markers such as HLA-B27. While AS is rarely seen in populations native to the lower latitudes of Sub-Saharan Africa or East Asia, it is most prevalent in the higher latitudes of Eurasia and Northern America. The historic references to a male predominance are still observed, but with slightly less strength than was once reported. Recent studies suggest male-to-female ratios of 2 or 3 to 1. In addition to having a lower frequency of disease, women also seem to have a slightly younger age of disease onset, with less ankylosing noted on imaging overall, and a milder course of disease. With these observed epidemiologic differences amongst ethnic groups and gender, investigation into the genetics of ankylosing spondylitis was clearly a logical step. Although most literature suggests that the pathogenesis of ankylosing spondylitis is governed by a two-hit hypothesis, with one hit coming from yet-to-be-identified environmental pathogens or exposures, and the second hit coming from an individual's genetic predisposition, multiple recent studies are leaning heavily towards genetics as the dominant factor, with heritability estimated as high as 90% for AS. This hypothesis has been supported with twin studies and other familial investigations which reveal up to a 16-fold increase in the risk for developing AS among first-degree relatives of patients with AS. Heritability of ankylosing spondylitis has been linked to HLA-B27, a major histocompatibility complex located on chromosome 6. Approximately 8% of the white Europeans are HLA-B27 positive, while the frequency is lower in other populations, such as Chinese. Up to 90% of patients with ankylosing spondylitis carry HLA-B27. The importance of HLA-B27 in heritability was further supported when we observed that 10-20% to of HLA-B27 positive patients who also have a first-degree relative with ankylosing spondylitis go on to develop disease.
This represents a 200-fold increase from the disease prevalence that is observed in the general population. When patients present with ankylosing spondylitis, they often complain of symptoms of inflammatory back pain as the primary feature of their disease. This differs from symptoms of mechanical back pain that clinicians see more commonly. Mechanical back pain is characterized by acute onset with patients being any age. Pain generally improves with rests, worsens with activity, and patients usually report minimal morning stiffness. In contrast, the inflammatory back pain of ankylosing spondylitis typically has an insidious onset with symptoms starting early in adulthood, usually before the age of 40. Patients often complain of significant nighttime symptoms with pain increasing with rest and improvement in symptoms with increased activity. Patients classically report morning stiffness lasting greater than 30 minutes and have symptoms that are alleviated with NSAIDs. Another classic finding in ankylosing spondylitis, which was not observed with mechanical back pain, is tenderness over the sacroiliac joints. Ankylosing spondylitis can also manifest as arthritis outside of the axial skeleton. Enthesitis is a common feature, and nearly 50% of patients with AS experience pain in their hip and shoulder girdles, with loss of joint space seen on radiographs. When hip disease is noted, it is often a marker of severe disease activity. Symptoms of peripheral arthritis are rare in AS. When they are observed, it is more commonly seen in women than in men. It is often asymmetric, oligoarticular arthritis affecting the lower extremities with higher frequency than the upper extremities. And like hip disease, it is a marker of severe disease activity. Many patients with AS also experience extraarticular manifestations of disease. Between 25 and 40 percent of patients with ankylosing spondylitis will develop anterior uveitis, with posterior uveitis being observed less frequently. Inflammatory eye disease and ankylosing spondylitis usually has a good prognosis if it is recognized early and treatment is initiated. Extraarticular AS disease activity can also include symptoms and pathology similar to Crohn's disease. Osteoporosis is another common disease manifestation. And less frequently, patients can experience cardiac disease in the form of aortitis, valvular disease, pericarditis, and conduction pathology such as complete heart block. Less than 1% of patients will develop pulmonary disease, with pulmonary fibrosis and pleural thickening being the most commonly observed forms of disease. And 4 to 9% of patients develop renal disease in the form of secondary amyloidosis and IgA nephropathy. When a patient with suspected ankylosing spondylitis is evaluated clinically, primary abnormality to look for is loss of spinal mobility. Spinal immobility can be formally assessed with three clinical tests. The first is Schober's test. To perform this maneuver, have the patient stand up and then mark the midline point between the iliac crests on the patient's back. Measure up 10 centimeters and mark this second point. Then, instruct the patient to bend forward in an attempt to touch their toes. Patients with normal flexibility in their lumbar spine will have expansion, with the distance between the two marks increasing by over 5 centimeters to a length of over 15 centimeters. Patients with decreased L-spine mobility due to AS have less than 5 centimeters of L-spine expansion with this maneuver. The occiput-to-wall test is a second test that measures spinal immobility. To perform this maneuver, instruct the patient to stand with their buttocks and their heels against a wall. Patients with normal spinal mobility will be able to touch their occiput to the wall behind them. Patients that are unable to perform this maneuver have cervical spinal immobility that is proportional to the distance between their occiput and the wall. This distance should be measured, recorded, and tracked over time. A third test of spinal mobility measures chest expansion. A tape measure is placed around the chest at the xiphoid process. Normal inspiration should expand the chest over 5 centimeters, although some variation is seen with age. Decreased expansion should be noted as a potential sign of thoracic ankylosis. Lab serologies can also help confirm a clinical suspicion of ankylosing spondylitis. While there are no definitively diagnostic tests, Checking serology for HLA-B27 in a patient with a concerning history in exam is helpful. 
Patients with active disease often have elevated general inflammatory markers, so checking the sedimentation rate and C-reactive protein is often useful at baseline and at subsequent visits as a marker of disease activity. Additionally, basic labs such as a comprehensive metabolic panel and complete blood counts should also be considered, especially prior to starting any medical interventions. The classic radiograph of a patient with ankylosing spondylitis shows evidence of sacroiliitis, which can progress to complete fusion of the SI joints. While joint space loss follows a chronic progressive course, many patients with ankylosing spondylitis will have some degree of sacroiliitis on imaging. As ankylosing spondylitis progresses, bony growths originating from the inside the spinal ligaments are often seen on x-ray. These growths are called syndesmophytes and are classically observed bridging between adjacent vertebrae. As the spinal ligaments calcify over time, the patient's back becomes progressively stiff, producing an x-ray finding called bamboo spine, aptly named for the woody, segmented plant that the spine begins to resemble. While x-rays are accepted as a first line of imaging in patients with suspected ankylosing spondylitis, MRI is a more sensitive tool for noting evidence of sacroiliitis. Because of the higher sensitivity, MRI is often useful in patients with early disease who have evidence of SI tenderness on exam but lack any objective findings on x-ray. Evidence of bone marrow edema can often be seen indicating active sacroiliitis in the SI joints of the patient. In attempts to help clinicians and researchers reliably and reproducibly recognize patients with ankylosing spondylitis, several diagnostic criteria have been published. The two sets of criteria that are most widely recognized and used remain the modified New York criteria and the criteria published by the Assessment of Spondyloarthritis International Society. Both criteria are similar using a combination of clinical and radiographic parameters to establish a diagnosis with the ASAS, including HLA-B27 and inflammatory markers as diagnostic criteria. The treatment of patients with newly diagnosed mild ankylosing spondylitis without significant extraarticular disease should start with NSAIDs. Monotherapy with NSAIDs is sufficient in many patients with nearly 80% of AS patients reporting substantial benefit from this intervention. For patients with refractory disease or significant extraarticular disease such as uveitis, TNF-alpha inhibitors should be strongly considered. Unlike rheumatoid arthritis, concomitant DMARD therapy is not usually suggested, and there is no evidence that TNF inhibitors slow the progression of radiographic joint damage like we have observed in the treatment of RA. Other DMARD such as sulfasalazine and methotrexate have been used, and have had some benefit in treating inflammatory arthritis in AS, but these drugs have fallen out of favor since the introduction of TNF inhibitors. Long-term use of glucocorticoids in managing ankylosing spondylitis is often avoided, especially given the increased risk of osteoporosis in this patient population. In conclusion, the key points of this lecture include the following. Ankylosing spondylitis is a chronic, systemic inflammatory disease with a predilection for the axial skeleton and a strong association with HLA-B27. Clinical features of disease include symptoms of inflammatory back pain and extraarticular symptoms that can include uveitis, symptoms, and pathology similar to Crohn's disease, as well as cardiac disease. Physical exam should include a formal assessment of spinal immobility using maneuvers such as the Schober's test occipital wall test, and measurement of chest wall expansion. Evidence of sacroiliitis and bridging syndesmophytes can often be seen on x-ray or MRI, and therapy should usually start with NSAIDs, and consideration given towards TNF inhibitors for refractory disease or patients with significant extraarticular disease should be made. Thank you for your time and attention, and I hope that you have enjoyed this lecture on ankylosing spondylitis.